Welcome to Passing the Plate, the podcast that's all about food, traditions, and the incredible connections they create. I'm Ashley Covelli, the food writer and recipe developer behind Big Flavors from a Tiny Kitchen. And I'm Lisa Listen, the genealogist and family history expert behind Are You My Cousin? We are your guides on this flavor-packed adventure. We're not just talking about recipes. We're diving into family history, exploring new cultures, and preserving favorite recipes for future generations. In short, we're celebrating the stories and tastes that come with every bite. So grab a seat at the table and let's head out on a journey of flavor, tradition, and connection. This is Passing the Plate, where every episode is a feast for the senses and a celebration of togetherness. In today's episode, we're going to find out what happens when Lisa and I tackle each other's family recipes in our own kitchens. I absolutely was, have been so excited about this episode, Ashley, because you know that you are my go-to person when I'm looking for recipes and when I'm stumped, when I need some a recipe to go somewhere. And so that's what I did to you back in December. I went to you with my um, family reunion that was coming up. Every year we have a a family Christmas gathering. It's it's a covered dish, It's a bit, but it is one side of my family, all the cousins, and this is family has been meeting for like over 70 years, usually the weekend before Christmas. I love that. And can you explain for those of us who don't know, what is a covered dish? I mean, I know oh. what a dish that's covered <laughs> is, but I haven't necessarily heard that outside of you saying that to me. So I can infer, but I would like to hear. Oh, what wow. I never, and I, I, I'm sure it goes by a different name other places, but a covered dish here, and I am from North Carolina, is basically when everybody brings a dish to share. How would okay. you, how what would you what would you call that a potluck? when everybody a pot a potluck yes absolutely but, we, but I think my mom um she lives in Indiana so I'm in New York I don't know what I would have called it before my New York days because I don't know how many potluck type things I went to as a kid um, or a teenager but I think that she calls like when they do it in her office I think she calls it a carry in oh so it's I've interesting not heard that. yeah it's interesting where how different regions say things like that differently. I think it all means the same thing. Just bring some food. We're going to share it. Not one exactly. person has to do all the work. Okay. So, sorry. Exactly. That's it. So, we all bring a food to share. And so, one of the tricky things for me, though, is that um, because I live one of the further ones away who, who are actually able to attend. So, I have about an hour and 45 to two hour drive to get there. It's easy to do in a day, but I want to take something Usually a side dish. One of the cousins usually takes care of the meats. They have a restaurant, so they take care of that. But So I wanted to take something, but I didn't want to just take the dessert or just the cake. You know, I wanted to take a side dish, a veggie type thing, but wasn't really sure because I need something that's pretty stable. You know, I have a cooler, but I, I don't want to risk, you know, I don't want to risk the food going bad in, in the travel. So I actually went to Ashley and said, hey, what can you recommend? And she recommended this wonderful potato salad. It's, and get me if I, catch me if I get, if I say it wrong, Ashley, it's Cal- Calabrese potato salad with green beans and tomatoes. Yeah, um, Calabrese, I think is how it's pronounced. My, my husband's family is from Calabria, that region of Italy. It's like, mm. It's near the toe of the boot. It's not the very tippy toe, but near the toe. So very southern Italy. Um, so like you may have heard of Calabrian chili paste. It's kind of oh, a yes. big thing right now. That's uh, chilies grown in that region of Italy. Um, and I did remember when you were asking me and you said you wanted a veggie dish, I remembered your dislike of mayos we've talked about <laughs> in some previous episodes. Uh, so I was trying to find something that I thought would fit the bill and that wasn't too heavy because I know a lot of times these potlucks or covered dish yes, or taken carry-ins, mm-hmm. whatever you call them, they can tend to be fairly heavy, which is fine. But, you know, sometimes you want a little bit of a reprieve there. Right, right. Yes. And it's really, you know, I, I wanted some. I didn't certainly do anything that would, you know, have mayonnaise or something that could easily spoil. And what I loved about your potato salad is that it was... Um, oil and vinegar based and right. I loved it because it was light because yes we do have quite a, quite a bit of heavy food although I've noticed as we've gone along certainly is you know the recipes have become more modernized definitely we have a healthier bent to our our family dinners these year these days although the dessert table is still like my favorite <laughs> the fact that there's a whole table is great but then I also remember I think the first question I asked you was how do you feel about garlic because this one has a lot of garlic but it's it's if you're a garlic lover and a potato lover, it's it's a great one. 
seriously. I, and I love garlic. You know, I think I told you I measure garlic with love and mm-hmm. <laughs> with heart. Just however much looks good, sounds good to me. It, and it really it it was a bit it was a big hit. People really enjoyed it, and it had I, and I love the garlic taste to it and really liked that vinegar the oil and vinegar part of it because it was lighter and it did I thought made it go better with other foods that were already there it seemed to be one that could could easily go with it with the other flavors that were brought in that day so I, it was a big hit at the family I've already bookmarked it um, I plan on taking it next year as well and oh, so, so yeah glad. it's it's going to become, you know, one of Ashley's family recipes is going to become probably one of ours. So, yes, that's, it's really exciting. That's so awesome. And I just that's one of the things I love so much about what I do is like and this wasn't even technically my family recipe. It's, you know, the family that I married into. And it's something that I learned from my father in law. And it was something that, you know, he just kind of threw it together. And again, he measured with his heart. But I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with him over the years, like watching him cook and learning how he did it. And I would pick up on little things here and there, like for this particular potato salad, you toss the um, the vinegar and stuff onto the potatoes while they're still hot, and it really helps it absorb the flavor more. So as it cools down, and this stuff is good at room temperature, it's also good chilled, so I thought that was another reason it might work for your type of gathering. Um, and he also does, and I'm pretty sure this is the one, it's both fresh and dry oregano. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it, I, it, I did not actually have fresh oregano, so I just had oh, to use okay. the dry. But it was still it, it still was yeah. delicious, certainly. Um, yeah, there's something like oregano is a very strong flavor, so it doesn't usually. I don't usually use a ton of it, but this recipe, it's like that makes such a nice. It's just such a nice compliment. And the other thing about this potato salad, it's not just potatoes. It's got green beans and tomatoes in it, and you kind of stir it all together, and everything kind of just melds, and it's really really nice. Um, and we. Me and my husband, actually, we call it the garlic. When we add extra garlic, which we often do to recipes, we jokingly call it the Italian multiplier. So if something (laughs) calls for one clove of garlic, that's just kind of a bit of a joke. So we'll (laughs) at least double um, often. Or sometimes I'll get those meal kits delivered and the the cloves will be teeny tiny. And I'm like, oh, no, no, we'll we'll go bigger with that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I've uh, absolutely. I, I. I'm very generous with my measurement of garlic, definitely. Yeah. What I like is this is because it's the potatoes, the green and green beans and tomatoes. It's kind of Christmassy looking. And of course, yeah. we're having a Christmas holiday. So it's just kind of fun to do. Yeah. Um, but actually, it, was, it, it was a big hit, definitely. And now that I think about it, it's also the colors of the Italian flag. Well, I had actually wondered, and I actually meant to ask you about that because I did notice that when I was making it, and I, I totally slipped my mind to ask you if that was part of the recipe. I don't know recipe. that it was intentional. I don't know. Hmm. I think when I, I think he always, if I'm remembering right, I think he always made it with the red skinned little potatoes, but I like doing the, if you can find the multicolored ones, just cause it even makes it more colorful, but it's great in the summer too. Like it's a nice, like chilled, um, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just, it makes me so happy. And he would, he would have been so happy to know that it made it to your family celebrations. And I'm sure he would have been hitting that dessert table too. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, that's wonderful. And, and I think that this is, I mean, this is how I think as, you know, we become more global and just living and, and connecting and m- more mobile. I think this is how a lot of these recipes just kind of find their way into areas. You might not necessarily expect to find them in the family, but I think it's a wonderful way of blending all the different um, cultures that come that come through areas. Totally. Um, so speaking of blending things, we spoke in a previous episode about your canasta mix, mm-hmm. um, which immediately made me excited because I love games, I love canasta, and I love snacks. So it's just like it's it's hitting all the good things. Um, so you had a handwritten recipe. The, what was the first one you showed me? Was from they were both, so I had two. They both said canasta mix on them. Um, now, I have to be, I have to probably clarify this. Nobody in my family plays canasta. That is, <laughs> the recipe literally has nothing to do with canasta. I think that was the original name out of a church cookbook somewhere. Oh, okay. So that's, so that's what it's called, but only in the, only in the recipe box. So th- they were both written by my mother, but, and I think, I'm wondering if she wrote one out and then clarified it in the second one, because one had more ingredients listed out and mm-hmm. one had you know better direction so I'm thinking she had like one was kind of a shorthand one and then the other one was the longer version of it 
So when Lisa had originally given me this recipe, uh, it was a photo of the recipe card. And as somebody who has looked at a lot of these old recipe cards and tried to discern what was going on, um, I had a lot of questions. And not all of them were ones that she necessarily had answers to. Some of them were things that I had to investigate a little on my own. Um, but and I knew there was a couple changes just based on the ingredients that I wanted to make. For those of you who aren't sure what we're talking about, it's kind of like a Chex Mix type of thing with like a cer like cereal and like salty kind of snacks. And you make like a, a spiced butter that you pour over it all and you bake it. Um, but so some of the things that were missing and just just from a repeatability standpoint for somebody who hasn't made it before and I had never seen it, so I hadn't tasted it. I hadn't experienced it. Some of the things that I were looking at was, okay, what size of box of wheat checks or Cheerios or Cheez-Its? Um, and, you know, because cereals come in different sizes and um, all these products do. And that's something I also ran into with that hot chocolate mix that I, we talked about in a previous episode. So I knew that when I went to buy the things, I was going to get some guidelines from Lisa um, and I said, you know, the family size boxes, the like more standard looking size boxes. So I made notes of all the sizes. So my hope is that I can get this uh, posted because it, it was great. We loved it. Um, that I can get this posted to share. So with the exact sizes that I used. Um, and then again, talking uh, about modifying recipes. So your mom's original one noted margarine. Just mm -hmm. three sticks. It's very light. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I said, I'll probably use butter. And Lisa said, oh, actually, you said you did use butter, just that hadn't been updated yes. or whatever? Yes. So I think when she started making the recipe was back probably 60s or 70s when margarine had come out. And that was yeah. kind of, people had kind of gone to margarine and we don't really do that as much anymore. Right. Neither one of us is, yeah used margarine. But I didn't even realize the, re the recipe said that until mm -hmm. you actually mentioned it to me. I'm like, Oh, wait, I use butter all the time. Um, yeah. I, I felt like one of those recipes of, you know, you would have these questions. And I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm one of those people who cooks and didn't write it down <laughs> or changes and didn't write it down um, that we've talked about in previous episodes. And, and, and especially like with the I know because you had asked me about the sizes of boxes. And I'm like, well, I got the regular box of the right wheat checks unless they were out. And then I'd get the family size. Yeah, <laughs> and it was literally and that's the thing. It doesn't always, especially for a recipe like this, it doesn't have to be exact, but having yeah. a good like baseline is really important. And noting, so I've now that I've noted the size of the boxes, just because a box is larger visually and the amount of space it takes up doesn't mean it weighs more. So the largest box weight wise of cereal, because there's some other things in it too, was the, by weight was the wheat checks. But that was actually the smallest box visually because those are heavier. So that was 14 ounces. And the rice checks was a bigger box and that was only 12 ounces. So just interesting things like that. And I had I had remembered from when we were talking about it um, that you mentioned adding mixed uh, one of the cans of mixed nuts. But you had also mentioned that your family likes to add pecans because you have the trees and all you your family really liked that. So, and I'm glad that I asked you about the nuts because you said, oh, wait, I, I think, I think that the recipe maybe only said pecans or something. And you were like, oh, we actually usually threw in a small can of the mixed nuts, but you mentioned to get either lightly salted or unsalted because with everything else, it could get really heavy mm -hmm. um, salt wise. So those were just some things that like, you didn't need to think about it. You knew how to make it, but now you kind of know if you're ever trying to document something, those are the kinds of questions that people might ask. Exactly. So. Exactly. Because when you're asking, I'm like, yep, that's what we, that's what, I'm, I wasn't surprised with the questions when you came back. I was like, yeah. oh, that's a good point. You know, I think that the original recipe says nuts as desired. Right. So you can wing that one. <laughs> right. Well, it's like, yeah, exactly. How much? So I ended up using... The can, I got the low sodium mixed nuts. It was 10.3 ounces. And then I mm -hmm. decided there were some pecans in there, but I decided to add an extra cup of pecan halves. Um, the only thing that I took a little bit of liberty with is instead of using garlic salt, onion salt, and celery salt, um, I do have celery salt at home, but usually I just have the powders and I add salt. So what I did when I 
prepared it was I used garlic powder, onion powder, and dried celery seeds, and then I added some salt um, oh. to the mix. And just things like noting like fine grain salt because not like a coarser salt, like a kosher mm-hmm. salt or something. So um, we had – this is February right now when we're recording. I know this won't be out for – Eh, till what april um but we had a chinese new year lunar new year party to attend and i was already going to be making some coconut jelly and i said oh this is an excuse to make this canasta mix because it said you said something about the largest roasting pan you have and you didn't have the a big <laughs> as big a one as your mom had and i was like apparently mine wasn't big enough either so i used two different <laughs> two different uh, very large pans Um, and then I also, one of them, my roasting pan couldn't fit sideways with the handles. So I had to use two ovens, which was fine. And I'm fortunate that I have two ovens because my, the one that I was using is a small one. So I didn't have like that bottom shelf. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was a big hit. It makes a ton. The mix is great. It's got like pretzels. It's got nuts, Cheez-Its, some different cereals, um, Cheerios and the Cheerios I found. I'm going to show Lisa. Look how cute. It's Mm -hmm. like. For heart month, look, they're little hearts. Oh, I like so, those. But I have a, a trivia question for you. And how, I know I don't know the answer. <laughs> how many cups of mix? Because that's one of the other things is like when you're writing a recipe, how many does this serve? How much does it make? So I'd like you to guess how many cups, because I measured it. I measured it all. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it by weight, but I did it by cups. Okay, Here. by cups. 25? More. More. 35? More. 40? It actually made 44 cups. Oh, my word. So I packed up two little to-go trays with 15 cups each with a cover, uh-huh. and then I wrote in Sharpie that it, because it was a fur party, that it contained nuts, dairy, and anchovies, because the Worcestershire sauce. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just in case. Um, and wheat. Because I one of my friends okay. there was gluten free. All the things, thing. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is so good. Everybody at the party enjoyed it. We've been snacking on it. I have some at my desk right now that I won't crunch on air, or you know, for the <laughs> for the listeners. But um, it's really, really good. And I surprisingly had never made Chex Mix before. I've eaten Chex Mix. I've never made it. So this is great, <laughs> and I'm glad to be adding it to my family slash party repertoire now. Well, I'm glad that you enjoyed that. And it is. It, it is kind of, most people just call it a Chex Mix. We in our family just call it cereal mix because, well, uses the three boxes of cereal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're real also, creative. I think we were also calling it party mix, like when I was, mm-hmm. I'd ask my son, you know. But um, I, I love the term canasta mix. I think that's great. <laughs> Have you ever asked Grandma for one of her secret family recipes? We've all been there. You try to bake her signature dessert and it's a total flop. She swears she told you exactly what she does. A pinch of this and a dash of that and bake till done. But what does that really mean? With the Passing the Plate video webinar and ebook bundle, we'll help you record recipes in a way that's easy to repeat at home. Learn to modernize favorite family recipes in a way that works for your lifestyle. And most importantly, preserve and share your culinary memories, recipes, and traditions with others. To learn more, head to passingtheplate.org slash resources. All right. Well, after enjoying some yummy canasta mix, <laughs> one of <laughs> one of the things that I've been making the last couple months is that is an Instapot recipe that I found at Ashley's website because um, I also have an Instapot. I love using my Instapot. It's fast, it's quick, it, and I can do kind of everything at once in one pot, basically. And it's her Instapot chicken, bacon, and potato soup. I needed something that... I was, we were kind of, our family was kind of in a time where, you know, people had a lot of activities going on. People were coming and going. My adult children were kind of coming in, going out, never quite sure who was going to be where, when. And so I really wanted something. I was just looking for something to have that would be, make a lot that I could save it in the refrigerator. People could, you know, get a good meal, but didn't, you know, I wasn't going to be in the kitchen all the time. So I I didn't even ask Ashley for this one. I actually just went and, and perused her website because I do that a lot, actually. And um, and I found this one, and it was wonderful. It uses chicken thighs and then with mm. bacon and some potato, chicken broth, onions, um, onions, and I think carrots as well. I can't remember off the top of my head, Ashley. Um, but it, and it was wonderful. It was a huge hit. And so it is definitely one that... I have now made several times and have kind of put into our, our regular routine. 
for for meals, especially when we've got a really busy time coming up. Again, mm-hmm. because it makes a lot, but it's easy. It stores so well, and it also freezes pretty well too. I was, so I was going to ask that. I don't think I've frozen this particular one. So, so I'm I did glad freeze it once. Um, the potato gets the texture of the potato can get a little grainy. I think sometimes okay. because potato because you know potatoes can do that. Interesting. But, because it's in the because it's a soup and it's yeah. you know you've got all the other issues you re- I never noticed it I was like oh this because I was like should I do it should I not so I tried it and I'm like really glad I did because mm. with it's you know got it's a soup and you have the chicken broth with it I thought it was perfectly fine I didn't have any problem and I'll freeze some more of it definitely yeah well and I love too I feel like soups are great because they usually taste better the next day. Yes. Um, and yeah, like the freezer, I always say it's like helping out future you. So today me is making the soup anyway. Might as well save some of it on the side so that future me can have this delicious meal without having to spend a bunch of time making it. Mm-hmm, definitely. And future me enjoyed that quite a bit. I'm, I'm so a Past me, present me, and future me appreciates that. <laughs> That's right. That's, I actually really, I, I think one of the things I'm going to do next time is when I make it, is I'm going to make up some corn muffins or something like that or mm. cornbread. Mm-hmm. Um, to have with, I think that would go really lovely with that um, yeah. as well. And then I could have those in the freezer and just kind of round out the meal that way too. That sounds so good. And I have a sweet corn muffin recipe on my site that that's my family's favorite. But speaking of cornbread, <laughs> so I was so excited after this whole, we had an episode on cornbread. Well, it was on, that wasn't necessarily the main <laughs> topic, but that's what we talked about a lot because Lisa's grandmom has this famous southern cornbread and I was so very excited to try it and we we're fortunate enough to have video footage of her making it and so I yesterday I finally made it um let me I'm gonna pull up my notes because this one didn't go as expected and it has nothing to do with the recipe I didn't oh. tell Lisa yet I told her I made the canasta mix and I loved it but I saved this one for the for the podcast so quick refresher the only ingredients are lard or vegetable shortening um to grease the pan your a cast iron skillet yes um self-rising yellow cornmeal which was tricky for me to find i wasn't able to find it locally so i ended up ordering it online buttermilk and some water and then butter to serve to slather i'm assuming did you did you did she slather it when she like before she served it or did everyone slather their own everybody did their own um, so I loved a lot of things about this recipe. A, I loved watching her in the kitchen and I made mm-hmm. some notes. So we have a clip of the video on the show notes for a previous episode, but I went in and watched like the three and a half long, minute long version. And some of the things I noticed that I don't know if you noticed, but, um, just cause I am used to watching for these types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, she she did bake it in the upper third of her oven so like the not the top rack but like down a notch but not down toward the bottom right um when I bake I I usually I use a I have a smaller oven so it's just one one rack really but um she mixed with her hands so when I made it I mixed with my hands and she kind of did this like scraping around the edge of the bowl and then kind of squeezing it squeezing it in the middle Mm -hmm. so it was very much a hands-on thing so she was going for that feel um she did spread it out into the blistering hot cast iron skillet with her hands for that one i went ahead and used a tool because i was a little a little worried about burning myself but i'm glad you did yeah (laughs) but i mean you could tell watching her that she's done this a million times and it, it just looks like it came so naturally to her which was amazing um and I, in the longer video, there's audio also, and I heard somebody asked her a question, and she said, I don't know, just enough so you can make it to pour it into the pan. <laughs> I thought that was really cute. That's uh, pretty and, much how she measured. And she did also say, this will probably be the worst cornbread I'll ever make, which I'm sure it was not. <laughs> and, and, and truly, literally, every single time she made cornbread, that's exactly what she said. That's Y'all are going to love it. It's the worst cornbread I made, I've ever made. And, <laughs> it, it, I mean, that was as big a joke and as big a part of making the cornbread as any, any as of the it. Cornbread. Um, so I did also notice when she, like, she mixed, and then when she went to open the oven and get the pan, she still had her batter-covered hand. She just used the other hand to, like, lifted that heavy cast iron skillet out one-handed, and it was just, I just... Like seamless workflow. It was it was very cool. Um, 
I noticed it was like a little lightly golden on top. And then she used a knife around the edge to kind of loosen it before she flipped it onto mm. a plate. And then when you when she lifted off the skillet, it was it was a darker brown, like a nice golden on what was the bottom in the skillet, but is now right. the top. Right. So I um when I made it, I was really interesting to see how much buttermilk it took for me to get what I thought looked like the consistency that she had. I think I might have added a little bit too much. Um like I mentioned before, I did shake it before measuring it because it does tend to separate sometimes. Oh, and I did see that her buttermilk, your notes to me was that she used real buttermilk. And I don't know if that meant like full fat or what you meant necessarily by real. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that the carton that she was pouring from said cultured non-fat buttermilk. Oh, had no idea. I didn't recognize the logo. Well, so I've found that often you can only find low fat or non fat. I didn't notice that part before I bought my buttermilk, so I I used low fat. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so just yeah. interesting things to keep your eyes out for. Sometimes I yeah, didn't recognize yeah. the logo on the carton that she used, but she went she went right through from the carton into the bowl. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And she may have just you know when they moved down there, I mean, she lived in the Eastern part of North Carolina. I mean, it just made them whatever was available to her. Right. Is what she, why she bought the one, that one. Um, then, so I did notice when I added the water and she said that, um, I think that's what she was saying. Just, uh, that it makes it enough so you can pour it into the pan, but also she said that it helps it come to stay together. Oh. Um, that's what I, that's what I heard her saying in that longer video. But I did notice when I added the water, the texture of it did feel really different. Like somehow the, the feels like the water did something to the cornmeal that the buttermilk didn't do, which was kind of odd. I think I did made me make mine a little too thin because hers looked a little thicker. I also think I didn't know what size of pan to use. So I used a 12 inch and I think I should have used my 10 inch. Um I think she used a 10 inch now that you say that. Yeah. So again, stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think to write down and when you're recording a recipe from somebody, but things that are very helpful. So mine was a little thinner. I, te I tested it for doneness before the amount of time that you had indicated on the recipe. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was I believe that the brand of self-rising cornmeal that I ordered online that was like $12 because I couldn't find it locally. Oh, gosh. I believe that this cornmeal has baking powder in it that contains aluminum. And this is... So, I hadn't even heard of self-rising cornmeal before our conversation a few episodes ago. Um, what I've seen online is that it it's cornmeal, but it also contains leavening agents like baking powder and salt and whatever. I've in the past experienced issues with a weird, like almost metallic sour taste in certain recipes that use baking powder. And years ago, I figured out it was because a lot of brands contain aluminum and you don't necessarily notice it. And I'm not saying whether or not that's a good thing, like to ingest aluminum, however you feel on that doesn't matter to me. But when it's noticeable in the taste, I think it's problematic, especially. So mm -hmm. recipes like my ricotta cookies that make gosh, like six or seven dozen that are delicious. I one time ruined an entire batch of those because they use quite a bit of baking powder for leavening. And I was taking uh. them to a cookie exchange and I tasted one after I decorated them all. And it was awful. And I had to remake it. It's like, um, it's like tangy and sour in the worst way. So I think that I couldn't find out what this brand, I'm not going to call out the brand, but I think that that Bake uh, corn, self rising cornmeal was bad. Uh, would it have? To, is there a difference when you're using something like that? Say with that baking powder type of issue, would be the fact that you were using a cast iron skillet? Would that? Oh. Is there an interaction? Would there be something? I I don't know because I don't. I've never really cooked with cast iron myself before. Oh, but okay. I'm curious. I don't, I don't do a lot of baking in my cast iron. You know, I do more mm -hmm. like fajitas and stuff like that. But um, I will say I do know there are a couple brands 
Rumford is one. It's like in a red can and it very clearly says aluminum free. And mm-hmm. Bob's Red Mill also says aluminum free. So I just would recommend to people when you're buying baking powder, and I think I have this on my site somewhere too. I have like a little note about this because it's <laughs> it's ruined things for me in the past. Um, that you should look for one marked aluminum free. Uh, so that being that. said, I don't want to, I'm torn because I don't want to stray too far from this recipe to try to figure it out. Um, I do know a couple of the things that I think I didn't do quite the right way, but if I were to use regular cornmeal and add my own leavening and salt, then is it still like, I know we want to adapt recipes and make them useful for ourselves, but I'm just curious how I can get it to be like hers having never Mm -hmm. tasted it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously we need to get together and cook together, but that, so that was fully in, (laughs) um, I, you know, I can't imagine, I mean, you know, she learned, she learned this from her mother. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my dad watched them do it together. Yeah. And so oh, that's lovely. the thing is, I mean, they would have, they would not, I, I was always surprised that she was made such a point about self rising because I don't know that they really had self rising on the farm. Oh. To me, I would have thought she would, they would have just had the cornmeal. I mean, they would have grown their own corn, taken it to the mill right. to get ground. But my guess, my, my assumption would be that they would, you know, and then leaven it themselves yeah, because they would use it for multiple things. I was always a little surprised. I really regret that I've never, you know, I, I never asked, um, mm-hmm. never thought about it back when she was al- alive and could, could share more of the secrets with us. So I was kind of, the thought of if you were to make it and, you know, using regular cornmeal and adding your own leavening agents mm-hmm. to me, I don't think that's really straying from the spirit of of her recipe because I, you know, I'm not so sure the original or the original method maybe is a better way to say it. Right. Had that. I'm really not sure. Or maybe she, did she work for big self-rising cornmeal, the industry? And she was just trying to promote it. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, 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 no. no. She lived on a farm in rural Virginia. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I feel like then with your blessing, I'm going to take another stab at it. Um, I'll have to buy more buttermilk because my son drank it, the rest of it. Um, oh. I, yes, he loved it. Um, so I, I think I'm going to try it again and I'm going to do regular cornmeal, yellow cornmeal. Mm-hmm. And I'll try to, I'll look at my, like my sweet corn muffin recipe to see about what the ratio was for leavening agents and salt and everything. Cause I also, I don't know how much, if the amount of salt that was in that, cause there's no salt added in the recipe. No. I don't know if that amount is at, like similar to what she would have used and mm-hmm. also when you put butter on it was your butter salted i'm guessing probably to be I honest mean, she used margarine a lot because okay. she kind of came a lot you know during, when i knew and i was growing up that was very much during the time period of margarine mm. it was good butter was bad so that's sort of and that was i think just country crock straight out of the tub yeah. <laughs> quite frankly but yeah i mean Butter would certainly would have been the original intent with that recipe. Absolutely. So, okay, so I'm gonna experiment a little more. I do have beautiful photos of it, and I oh, did great. also throw I I did throw a little hot honey with the butter just to see, like, because I like I like I do like my oh. cornbread a little sweet, but that was kind of fun because it made it a little spicy too. But do you remember if the cornbread tasted a little salty? Like, did it taste a little? Because this one didn't. It just tasted like I don't remember it tasting salty, but there was absolutely it was not sweet. Absolutely, okay. you know, no sweetness in okay. the butter in the in the, in the recipe, as you know, because there's there's no sweetener right. in the recipe. But so yeah, it's definitely not um, not sweet at all. But I but can't also, say that it tasted salty. Right. I don't. I don't remember a taste of salt. Um. Yeah. So I'm curious. I wonder if the sweetness in cornbread is a regional thing. Because I'm wondering, I think all the cornbread I've had in my life, it's been not overly sweet, but definitely like a little sweet. Interesting. Well, scientific experiments will continue. Um, Well, I think my grandmother would really enjoy that. I'm sorry she's not around to hear all our (laughs) our ups and downs on trying to recreate this particular cornbread recipe, because I think she would really get a kick out of it, quite frankly. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And if you end up experimenting with it at all, too, I'd be curious. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what you come up with. Definitely. Definitely. 
Find the links to the recipes and the resources that we've mentioned in today's episode in the show notes at passingtheplate.org forward slash 12. That's a wrap on this episode of Passing the Plate. We hope you enjoyed our journey into the world of food, traditions, and the amazing connections they create. It's been a pleasure sharing these stories and flavors with you. Remember, food is more than just sustenance. It's a way to connect with our past, present, and future. So keep sharing your meals, keep passing those plates, and keep creating memories that will last a lifetime. Head to passingtheplate.org slash podcast for show notes.